Great. Hello and welcome, everybody, to the Agriculture, Food, and Natural Resources Career Choice Panel Discussion. We are very excited to have our panelists and participants with us today. To get things started, we'd like to know how you are joining us. In other words, please let us know if you are joining us as an individual attendee, which is viewing on your own device, or if you're participating as a class via the poll on your screen. We'll give um, folks a few more seconds to respond. If you'll please just answer the question that comes up and we can check the poll. Thank you. All right, great. It looks like about 83% of our attendees are participating individually and the class is around 17%, so that's great. However you are joining us today, we hope you'll actively participate in the discussion. While you cannot chat with our panelists via the chat feature, you can and are encouraged to submit questions for the panel or a particular panelists via the Q&A feature. Submit your name or class name with your question and we'll read it along with your submission or feel free to submit a question anonymously. There will also be a couple of polling questions like the one we just completed just a, minute, uh, just a moment ago. Please submit your answers promptly to have your responses recorded. Now, without further delay, I'd like to turn things over to the panel's moderator, Tia Yancey with Averett University's CCECC. Thank you, Sherry. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm hoping you're doing well this morning and excited about this great uh, group of panelists we have today. Um, as mentioned, yes, my name is Tia Yancey. I am with Avery University Center for Community Engagement and Career Competitiveness, also known as the CCECC. We're a fun group here. Um, we actually um, provide students with community engagement efforts. Um, we go out into the community and volunteer. We uh, partner with over 200 local nonprofits in the area where we get our students out to either do beautification projects. Uh, we partner to also um, participate in Haven of the Dan, Dan River Women's Association through um, domestic violence. We encourage uh, service learning, uh, career development, and also um, um, studying abroad efforts. So it, it's pretty much a Fun thing we do here, I, I like to tell people we try to keep our students off Netflix and out into the community and um, engaging in those efforts. But enough about me, we have an awesome group of panelists. I'm going to let them go ahead and introduce themselves and tell them a little bit about themselves and what they do. So we'll start with Drew. All right, my name is Drew Arn. I'm with the Virginia Department of Forestry. I'm a senior area forester for the Dan River work area, which encompasses Pennsylvania, Halifax, and Charlotte counties. Um, the Department of Forestry is a, is a state organization that has different roles. We, we do firefighting and some regulatory work on the logging industry, but we also uh, are a free resource to landowners for information. We work in education, teaching classes, um working with people in the community so if you're a, if you're an, a landowner that has a, a farm that has a forest on it we're a resource that can that can help you advise you as to what to do as an objective opinion uh for the biology of the trees um <clears throat> i've been with the department of forestry for 22 years um i have a a bachelor's degree in forestry from Virginia Tech. Most of your land grant universities um, will have a forestry program. Um, and I'd like to try to represent both the private sector and the government sector for forestry. So if you have any questions about other possible careers uh, or other other ways that you could work in forestry other than just government, I'd, I'd be happy to try to answer those questions as well. Um, 
first ever job. I was trying to remember that. I probably was uh, mowing grass or something, self-employed as a <laughs> as a teenager. Um, but my first job professionally in forestry, I did some internships with the Department of Forestry while in college. Um, and also, uh, when I once graduated, I worked for several consulting firms uh, doing field work uh, in private private forestry. Um, my favorite part about the job is that it changes with the seasons um, and you get to be outside and you get to be fairly independent and, and kind of um, every day is a little bit different. Um, you're not in the same spot all the time doing the same thing. Sounds exciting, uh, uh, Mr. Earn. <laughs> that we'll move next to our next panelist, which is Morning. Um, my name is Krista Hodges, and I'm the education manager for the Dan River Basin Association. And I have been doing this job for 10 years now. But our organization is a nonprofit that is by state. There are not many organizations out there that are by state. It covers both Virginia and North Carolina, and we cover 16 counties and 3,300 square miles with our organization. And we have um, around 1,000 members in our organization right now. We are a member based nonprofit. So we have members that support our organization. And then we get our funding from um, foundations, donors, sponsors, um, that kind of situation. We rely a lot on grants. And then for my job itself as education manager, I, like I said, I've done this for 10 years. I love doing what I do. I work with a lot of students and schools throughout the basin, providing environmental education programs hands-on learning opportunities, um, project-based learning, um, such as like trout in the classroom, string side trees in the classroom. And then also um, some of more of our recent projects are such as the green schoolyard project where we um, get rain barrel systems and butterfly gardens and composting and hands-on opportunities to get students outside learning, you know, not just looking at a thermometer and a book. Instead, we're getting them outside and using the tools and the resources outside so they're not just learning through a book anymore. Um, let's see, have I always worked in this field? Yes, I've always been in kind of the environmental natural resource focused field. Um, when I first got out of college, I was an upward bound math and science advisor. Um, for Patrick Henry Community College here in Martinsville, Henry County. And I worked with first generation um, students that were wanting to go to college, particularly in the math and science field. Um, that was my first job right out of college. But during college and in high school, I worked at a restaurant as a server, bartender, hostess. I did that, like I said, all the way through high school and through college. So I was very busy all the time. Um, didn't have much time to sit around. But um, you can see here, you know, this picture in the bottom, um, one of the more recent projects that I've worked on that has been really cool related to the environment is planting Monarch way stations. And so we have two way stations in the um, basin right now. One is at the Virginia Museum of Natural History, and then the other one is at Albert Harris Elementary School, which is in Martinsville. So as far as post-secondary education, um, I have a degree in environmental science. I got it from Avery University. I graduated there in 2009. Um, Ms. Laura Meter was my most favorite professor there. And let's see, my favorite part about my current job is that I never do the same thing every single day. It changes every single day. I work with students um, throughout the basin. I get them outside doing things that, you know, maybe they've never done before and they get really excited about it, you know, and they want to do it more. So um, I just love what I do. And I work with a lot of grants and securing um, 
money for these kinds of programs. So thank you. Thank you, Krista. That was great. Um, I'm interested in hearing more about that later. Uh, next, we have Ms. Laura Leftman. Hi there. Hopefully you guys can. Can you see me or hear me? We can hear you, Laura. We can't see you. Okay. All right. I'm having some technical difficulty. I'm, I'm on my phone now instead of my no computer. Um, but hopefully you can hear me. Um, so I graduated. I'm from Georgia originally. <laughs> And I graduated from, let me, let's see. Let me try to get out of this other meeting. Okay, can, I'm back to you again. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. No worries. All right, I'm gonna start over. Um, I'm from Georgia originally. I, uh, from, a, from a small town, I was raised on a farm. And so I knew from an early age that I wanted to be a veterinarian. Um, I wanted to be a small animal veterinarian, although I was raised on a farm. And um, I crossed state lines, went to Auburn University for an undergraduate degree in zoology. And I went on to stay there at Auburn for vet school. So vet school, it's a four-year degree, basically, um, after, after your undergraduate degree. So it takes eight years to become a veterinarian. And then in 1994, I came to, um, to Danville and started, uh, I, I bought into Animal Medical Center, which is where I'm at now. And I've, I've been there since 1994. So I'm a small animal veterinarian. We see all dogs and cats and a few pocket pets like ferrets and guinea pigs and rabbits and that sort of thing. But it's virtually all small animal. Um, we've recently also purchased Brosville Animal Clinic as well as we started Mount Hermon Animal Medical Center. So there, we have three practices in Danville um, with about eight different veterinarians. Um, altogether, we have about 40 support staff between the veterinarians, the technicians, um, kennel, doggy daycare, um, receptionist, and grooming. So a veterinary hospital is a little small business. We have all the same equipment that a human hospital would have, except for the really fancy tools. You know, we have digital x-ray, we have ultrasound, we have all in-house laboratory equipment. Um, the very expensive equipment, of course, like a CT scan or MRI, you would have to go to a specialty practice for. But I love veterinary medicine. I love the variability of it. I love that it's like a new little puzzle every day. And I love that I never know what I'm going to see from day to day. Um, I love that I don't work in an office all day and I love to have, it's a very relational job and that we see clients all day long and we get used to, we get to kind of figure out what's going on, not just with the pet, but we see the whole family from the beginning to the end of a pet's life. So it, it's a very rewarding job and, and I love it. I'm glad that I picked this profession. Thank you so much. Well, we're going to get started. We have a few questions from our guests today. Um, so from Callie, did, um, to the panelists, did you plan to work where you work now? Was that in your plans? I can, I can go ahead with that one. I, I'm originally from this area. Uh, when I moved away, I uh, was working away from home. I was further up in the mountains, up in the Shenandoah Valley, um, and I didn't I didn't plan to be here. Um, I, I said goodbye to red clay and tobacco fields, and I wanted to go to the mountains. And um, but since both my my wife's family and my family are all from here, once we you know were settling down and and thinking about long-term future plans, it made more sense to be closer to family. So we ended up coming back. Um, but it's interesting to, to leave and come back and, and, and certainly doing this job, you find that uh, some of the things that you thought somewhere else had that this area didn't have, you discover that where you grew up had them too. You just didn't notice them, you overlook them. Um, but yeah, I, I um, and, and, one interesting thing I mentioned to someone recently was that um, not all foresters or people in the forestry community are firefighters. That's something specific to our job. And that was not something that I had aspired to do was to be a firefighter. Um, but that came with the job and it is it's certainly a rewarding part of the job and, and an exciting part of the job. But that was something that, that just happened to happen because of, of where I ended up landing. Mm -hmm. 
So I didn't always know that I wanted to do this job in particular. I actually, when I was in college, if you would have asked me then what I wanted to do, I actually wanted to do the opposite of Drew. I wanted to go to the ocean. I wanted to work in marine biology along the ocean, particularly in like the North Carolina area. I just wanted to be down there at the water. I had an interest in sharks when I was in college. Um, so I wanted to head that way, but um, also like Drew, I actually have family roots here. I'm from Pennsylvania County. And my husband is also from this area. He's from Franklin County. So it just worked out. Like I said, when I graduated college, I had a job. I graduated on a Saturday. I had a job waiting for me here on a Monday, on that Monday. So I had a job here and it just clicked right along for me to get to where I am now. Um, I had a job right after the upward bound math and science job. I actually worked for Virginia Tech um, through their research and development facility uh, here in Ridgeway, Virginia. I raised saltwater shrimp um, for research. So, and like I said, that was through Virginia Tech. And then after that, that's when I got this job. And I love what I do. I love being here and seeing, you know, all the youth in the area take interest in the things that I'm doing. And, you know, there's a lot of diversity here for wildlife. I thought, you know, I would go to the ocean and see all of the wildlife that are, you know, around the ocean and are in the ocean, but there are so many different types of wildlife here. And most people, I tell like my daughter, I tell her like, learn the wildlife that you have here because there's so much, most people don't even know, like all the different types of snakes or, you know, different types of wildlife that live here. So learn those organisms first and then we'll see about learning the rest of the world, so. And, and I guess I'm probably an exception to the rule. I knew from a very early age what I wanted to do. And so I, I did picture myself in a small animal hospital. I had no idea I would be in Virginia, but um, that's where I'm, that's where, that's where it happened for me. Perfect. Laura, uh, Laura, I had a question directed towards you. Is vet school like med school? Um, it is pretty much exactly like it, except there's, unfortunately, there's not enough veterinary schools in the country. So currently it's harder to get in veterinary school than it is med school. We'll have thousands of applicants for about a class of 100. Um, so if you want to go to school to be a veterinarian, you've really got to be super competitive. I mean, you know, I've written applications for kids that have very high GPAs and they still don't get in vet school. Um, but it is, the, it is the same thing. I mean, animals have all the same problems that we have. They get diabetes, they have kidney problems, um, they have liver problems, they need special diets, you know, they have problems in birthing, all the same things that we have, they have a counterpart to. Um, and so we are taught all those things in vet school. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Drew, I have a question for you. Do you take care of more than just trees? Other things such as community gardens, tree planting, and et cetera? Uh, we do some, some work uh, in communities. We, some of, I guess some of our, our field staff in the state focus more on urban forestry because they're in an area that is more urban. Uh, here locally, we're, we're managing forests on a, probably a larger scale, more so like on a farm. Mm -hmm. um, but individual, I mean, I'll have somebody in the town of Chatham or Halifax call and say, I have a sick tree, what's wrong with my tree? So, I'll, mm -hmm. you know, that's an individual tree problem. And, and I am, I'm a certified arborist. Um, and so that's kind of working in more of the, um, the urban environment. Um, so we do that, but for the most part, we focus on trees. We do write, help people with management recommendations for wildlife and things like that too. Wow. Um, on their land, um, but for the most part, we focus on, on trees and growing trees well. Okay, perfect. Uh, Krista, a question for you. How many plants have you planted? Do you keep Goodness. I don't think I can answer that question exactly. Um, what One of the programs that I do is um, Streamside Trees in the Classroom as well, and we plant riparian buffers with students using um, black willow trees. And so we have probably planted hundreds of trees over the last several years. That program in particular 
is getting ready to reach its 10 year anniversary. And then the gardens that I was telling you about, the Monarch Way stations, uh, those are really neat. Um, something I definitely want to expand throughout the basin to help save the Monarch butterfly. Um, and right now, like I said, we have two of those gardens, but we have planted definitely hundreds, if not a thousand or more plants throughout the basin. Wow, that's exciting. Okay, so what, uh, uh, for all the panelists, what is the least favorite part of your job? Paperwork. <laughs> yes, I, you know what, I have to agree. <laughs> Part, you know, if you're in natural resources, it's because you want to be hands-on or in out in the field or working with animals or whatever, you know, that part of it. And unfortunately, all of that stuff comes with a lot of uh, red tape, at least working for the government anyway. Yeah, I get that. What about you, I, that I have a, a least favorite part per se, but um, we are a nonprofit, so we do rely on like grants for funding. I'm sure you know what that's about, Tia, but um, I would say just Year to year, you just got to make sure you have the funding that you need when you work for a nonprofit. Definitely. And and for me, the worst part of the job really would be is that, unfortunately, all this technology does cost money. And so we can't give our services away for free because my x-ray machine costs $80,000. Um, and people don't really understand that. We're not like the human hospital where we're getting grants or we're getting, you know, some sort of federal subsidy. It's a private business. So it's really hard for people to make an economic choice with a pet that they really love, but we would go bankrupt if we didn't make economic choices. So we try to help people when we can, but we can't help everybody. So, you know, having to put a price tag on medicine is hard. Yes, that, I totally understand that. So, um, Laura, I have a question. Um, Aubrey wants to know, how old do you have to be to become a vet assistant? Um, our our uh, liability carrier requires for kids to be 16 or older. Okay. Okay. So you have to be 16. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so I have a question to the panelists. What education do you need to do your job? We, we have positions that are both uh, two-year technical degrees from different schools that have forestry programs. Dadme Lancaster up in Covington is a good example for in Virginia. Um, I think maybe Southside Community College is looking at, at possibly starting one in forestry. Um, and then for the other positions within the department, uh, like mine, it was four year, four year bachelor's in science degree. Um, and of course, I'm sure we have people that are masters and, and some, some in our research department that's doing, doing some high end research work. There's, there's a couple doctors there, but, you know, so it, it's across the board, a two year technical degree to, to being a doctor in forestry, you can. It, it depends all on what you're doing. Perfect. Sounds good. Okay. So the minimum that you have to have to be in my job is a Bachelor of Science as well, particularly in the environmental science field is excellent. Um, but since I've been here for those 10 years, I've also pursued um, Virginia Natural Resources Leadership Institute through UVA and Virginia Tech. And then also I am pursuing right now a Duke nonprofit management course. Mm -hmm. And then for my job, I'm similar to Drew's job. If you want to be a veterinarian, like I said before, you have to have a four-year degree in some sort of science. I pick zoology. Some, people's would, some people would pick like a feeds and feeding, or they would pick a, um, an agricultural degree as an undergraduate degree. I was just interested in zoology, um, and then four years uh, of, a, of a vet school. But we do have people that work here that have an associate's degree in science, um, in veterinary technology, a licensed veterinary technology um, person is, is similar to an RN, and, um, and that's what we depend on to do our, to do our, all of our technical skills, run the equipment, put catheters in, 
um, take care of the patients very much like an RN. So, um, and then we have lay people who have really no formal education. They come to us and we teach them. Um, they start in the kennel and they work their way up and they learn the job along the way. And then we try to assist them in at least doing an online veterinary technology program, that kind of thing. So their education can continue to grow. Great, okay, thank you. So Kristen Drew, Devin wants to know, how does your job change in the winter? <laughs> well, we, I mentioned that we change with the seasons. Um, usually in the spring of the year and fall of the year are our most busy times with fire. Mm -hmm. um, out, if you were out west somewhere, it would be summertime is the most busy time with fire. So we're, on the east coast, it's a little bit different. Um, but certainly in the wintertime, uh, a, a lot of our folks that work for the Department of Forestry, things get a little bit slower in the wintertime. Um, some people like that if, they're, if they like to hunt because that time of year they can take more time off or that sort of thing. Um, I myself enjoy my field work a lot more in the wintertime uh, because there's just a lot less weeds, a lot less bugs, and a lot less pests <laughs> that when you're out there in the woods and you can see a lot better. Um, but uh, so far as helping landowners and being out and about in the field uh, wintertime, you're still, you're still out there kind of doing some of the same things. Good day. For myself, um, I would say definitely like obviously spring through fall, fall, we're outside, you know, planting trees or planting. But in the wintertime, it doesn't, I mean, it slows down a little bit, but we definitely focus on different things. Um, I'll do a lot of like visiting schools in the wintertime, do a lot of um, you know, education programs in the classroom during the winter time, um, trout in the classroom that goes through the winter time. And then um, I'll also do a lot of like paperwork. That's when I'll write a lot of grants or even like, um, you know, lesson planning for the programs that we want to do. Sometimes I even design new education programs in the winter time. But we also do um, water quality monitoring during the winter time for with both um, Virginia Saver streams, which is monitoring the macroinvertebrates, the aquatic insects that are in the stream or that's done in the wintertime, and then also bacterial water quality testing for E. coli that's also done in the wintertime. So some things change, but not a lot. Wow. Uh, so Laura, how do you deal with stress from, uh, how do you handle the stress from dealing with ill pets and have to put them down? Well, when I was younger, it was very difficult emotionally to kind of distance yourself. But as I've gotten older, I've realized that you're doing those pets a favor. They're suffering, their family unit is suffering, and there's nothing generally that you're going to be able to do, either because the pet has reached an end of their lifespan or because economically the, the owner cannot do what it, whatever they need to do. So you're doing that pet a favor, and I would much rather relieve animal suffering. Um, and so now I, I handle it fine. We don't do any... Um, we don't do euthanasias just because people want us to. So that helps, you know, that's the job of unfortunately like the humane societies and that sort of thing. So if someone were to come in here and say, I just don't like my dog, I want to put him to sleep. We don't do that kind of thing. Right. Um, so the animals that we're seeing are being euthanized for medical purposes. And, um, and it is, it is sad. It's heart wrenching, but at the same time, I know I'm doing that pet a favor. Yeah. Oh, Okay, to the panelists, all three panelists, what has been your favorite project? Hmm. hmm. I'll, I'll mention maybe uh, one interesting thing that, that I was able to do uh, certainly, anytime you're watching trees grow or watching or getting trees planted and and seeing something successful happen where you know a lot of good is being done, that's that's always a positive thing. Um, but I was able to get involved uh, quite a few years ago in a new program. It's called the Urban Forestry Strike Team, where we respond to usually post storm events in municipalities. I, I was able to go to uh, 
Baton, Lou Baton Rouge, Louisiana, um, Tulsa, Oklahoma after an ice storm, uh, where we go in and we help municipalities, uh, say an arborist for a city, to essentially do a post-storm assessment of the trees that are left and what damage is there and basically set out the design of their scope of work so that they can prioritize what they need to do to mitigate risk uh, from damaged trees. Um, and that was a lot of fun because get, you get to work with people from all over the country and different agencies, um, different foresters from all over. And it was interesting just because it was a team effort and, and the way that that whole system works, you get a lot of work done in a short amount of time and it really always surprises you what you can accomplish. Great. My favorite project that I'm working on right now um, has definitely been the Green Schoolyard project at Albert Harris Elementary. Um, we've been doing that project now for three years and it started out um, with a butterfly garden and we, you know, it made improvements for it to become a monarch way station. And then we added a rain barrel system for the school to use so the students could water the butterfly garden. And then we added a compost, um, a compost site for the students to start composting in the classroom. And then they would dump their um, fruit and vegetable scraps in the compost bin and then put this, um, it would turn into a very nice fertilizer for the butterfly garden. And then we've added on in the past couple of years, we added on uh, a bee conservancy native bee box uh, for the native bees to live there and or would for them to lay their eggs there. And then also we added on a bluebird um, house that has a camera in it. We're adding the camera this fall, but the students will be able to watch the bluebirds lay their eggs and watch the eggs hatch. Um, while they're in the cafeteria having lunch, they'll be able to watch this process happening over um, a TV that's gonna be uh, broadcasted in the cafeteria. And so that's gonna happen this year. We're getting the camera in there. The, the bird box is already in place. And then we're also planning, we've already been working on um, adding a trail, a nature trail around the school for the students to go hike and um, you know just be outside and do some more hands-on stuff. We've done a storm drain marking at this particular school as well. So the students can learn where uh, the stormwater runoff goes to, which it goes to the, the streams. Um, so yeah, this has been a fun project and we just keep adding on to it year after year. One more thing that I wanted to mention is that we added a weather station so the students could monitor the weather um, when they go outside. So they can take notes and make observations about the weather. So. It's just been a great project and we just continue to expand it. And I know the students love it. And for, for me, I, I can't really say that I have one favorite project because I might see 20, 25 patients a day. Um, I, I love the variability of my job. Again, I like to see different things at different times of the day. I love being able to do soft tissue surgery and take like bladder stones out of a dog when they can't urinate. It's very satisfying to remove these things that look just like river rocks out of the bladder and then the dog wakes up and, and they can urinate again. Yeah. Or you know, the dog eats a sock and you open up his intestinal tract and you pull out a sock, that's like instant gratification. Um, so I, lo I, I love that, but I, I mean, I also love seeing a new puppy every day. Who doesn't love a puppy? I know. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, to you all, when did you decide to, for sure what you wanted to do? I actually started out wanting to be an architect. That's what I went to Virginia Tech for. Um, and just once looking at the program, I, I realized it wasn't exactly what I thought it was going to be. And so I started looking around and I had done the forestry contest with the FFA all through high school. And of course, grew up playing in the woods and, and you know, knew, knew most of my trees and, and had enjoyed 
uh, helping my dad cut firewood and things like that. I just really liked being outside. And so I started looking at the classes in the forestry program and, and I really related to a lot of what I saw. And that's, that's when I decided that was, that was the direction I wanted to go in. So um, I, I figured out kind of in like 2010, I knew that I wanted to get a job that I could just, that would no longer be a job, it would be a career. And so I had a friend who's a conservationist, um, Dr. David Jones, he's an orthodontist here in Martinsville. He had actually um, bought my husband's land. He had a, a large tract of land all, along the Smith River here in Henry County. And his, um, he was planning to conserve the land, uh, put an easement on it so people couldn't uh, n do anything else with it. They couldn't develop it into anything else. And so when I started talking to him, he said, you know, there's this organization, the Dan River Basin Association, and I think you would be a perfect fit. You know, I know you already work with students. You have a, an interest in environmental science and, you know, the natural resources. And he just kind of pointed me in the direction to DARVA. And as soon as I got the job, you know, in 2011, I just knew that it was something I wanted to do and something I wanted to stick with. It's been a fun job. And at this point, I have no interest in changing, you know, my, my job at this point, so. And I was a very, very young girl. I was, I, I have a, my mother has a, uh, like a book report type thing that I did in about second or third grade saying that I want to be a veterinarian one day. So, um, you know, I've known since the seventies what I wanted to do. Good. Wow. Well, okay. I'm going to jump now. So what is the salary range for people in your field? That's a, uh, and it's pretty widely ranging. A lot of it's going to depend on whether you're in the private sector or with the government, uh, what level of education you have and what the position is. I think I think we start our technician positions probably start out uh, in the lower 30s. Uh, the foresters are upper 30s. Um, so with with government, it's usually not as much as the private sector. So if I were starting with a company, uh, a timber company or a management company of some sort, uh, and it would be higher, uh, but you would probably be, you know, maybe the benefits aren't as good in some of the other areas. And of course, in industry, you don't always have as, as much uh, job security as you would, would with government. Um, but it, it's gonna vary quite a bit depending on education and where you're at and what the job is. So in the nonprofit um, world, you know, you may hear that the pay is not as great uh, as like the state or the federal levels, but honestly, it's, you know, it's comparable to some of the other jobs in our area. Starting out, you can make around 30,000 and then um, the upper level positions are around 60,000. So for people in my office, we would, we may have receptionists that are making $15 an hour. We may have um, starting out technicians that are making $13 an hour. A licensed veterinary technician might make $20 an hour. The veterinarians, unfortunately, right now, because the vet schools are very, very expensive, the average uh, student loan debt for a veterinarian getting out of vet school is almost $300,000 their starting salary is right around $100,000 a year. Okay, we have time for one more question. Um, well, we'll close with a, a quick piece of career advice from you all. Um, if you could share one thing, um, please share. <laughs> I'll, I'll build upon something Krista said, and that's, that's, uh, deciding what you do is to be a career and not a job. Uh, and I'll build on that by saying, you know, find something that you enjoy doing uh, because that makes salary a little less important um, than it would be if you're, you know, flipping widgets on a conveyor belt in a factory somewhere. 
Um, so find something that you enjoy doing so that on, you know, Monday morning, you don't say, oh, I really don't want to go to work. Mm-hmm. You say, it's this Monday morning. I got things I got to do, you know, so you go do them and you enjoy doing them. Um, so, yeah, f- figure out what you want to do as a career, not a job. And make sure it's something that you enjoy doing because that that uh, that's worth a whole lot of money. I agree with Drew completely. You know, I think one of the things is that when you get out of college or high school, you might have this dream job, you know, in your mind. And, you know, for some people, you know, that's definitely an option. But for most people, it's really hard to find that dream job like when you first get out of school so one of the things that I did was I started um, working in jobs that were related to what I wanted to do and that way I could build up the experience that I needed to eventually get the career you know that I wanted to be in and I, I love all of the jobs that I've had I definitely have enjoyed them but they have all contributed to the career that I have now. And if I wouldn't have done those, you know, jobs to begin with, I probably wouldn't be in this position that I'm in now. So I'm thankful for it. Just keep that in mind, you know, just take a little bit of experience and maybe pile it up and eventually you can get the dream job that you want to have. Perfect. And so my piece of advice would be that um, I, I, I have four children and, um, and several of my older boys who are now um, out of college did not always know what they wanted to, to do, but they knew what they were passionate about. They knew what areas of things interested them. And kind of like what Krista's saying, even if you don't have that targeted view like I had, I, I grew up thinking everybody knew exactly what they wanted to be when they were nine years old. And when I got into college, I realized that people did not know what they wanted to do. And that's okay. Um, I was, I was, I thought I was the majority, but I was the minority and my children have definitely taught me that the majority of people don't really know what they want to do and that's okay, but you do know what your interests are. You know, if you like to be outside, you know, if you have a tendency to love to read, you know, if you're great at math, um, go ahead and try to develop, try to figure out, you know, different jobs that you can do that develop those skills. Um, and knowing that every job that you have, you do pick up those soft skills that you need. You've got to, you know, I love puzzles and I love uh, math and I love science, but if I can't communicate with the clients, I don't even get the opportunity to do what I love to do. So I've got to be able to also, you know, articulate what I want to do. Um, So my, my kids, you know, students that come up that want to shadow me, I think that's a wonderful thing. And I encourage, you know, if you wanted to be a veterinarian, what you need to do is branch out to some of the area veterinarians, large animal, small animal, and see if you can get some experience or just shadow them on a weekend or over a school holiday. Because sometimes what they do isn't what you think they do. And so um, I've had kids come in here and they say, oh God, your, your job is gross. I would never want to do your job. And, and my job is gross. You know, if you you can't take blood and poop and urine all over you and anal glands you're not gonna really do well in this field it is not a glamorous job um but I, I love it and there, there's some kids out there right now who would love this job um you just have to listen to your heart because again the paycheck isn't what's important you don't want to go to work every day of your life it is too much mm-hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you all. I'll turn it back over to um, Sherry and Jesse. Thank you to our moderator, Tia, and to Krista, Drew, and Laura. Um, I have a quick poll to kind of close us out before Sherry gives some last minute details about kind of career choice and your participation broadly. Um, I'm curious to know if you had heard of any of the organizations So the DARBA with uh, Krista, the Virginia Department of Forestry with Drew, um, or the Animal um, Center with Laura before today, and then also what you were most surprised to learn from our panelists. So I'll give you just a few moments um, to put in your responses through the poll that you have on your screen, um, and then we'll take a peek at the results.
All right, so we were pretty, almost an even mix of yes and no's about having heard of the organizations that we have here today. And then most of you were most surprised by kind of the experience and what kind of the jobs entail that everyone will. I'm going to switch things over to Sherry. All right. Students, we hope you were exposed to some new careers and organizations in our region today. You can continue your career exploration through Major Clarity and the Career Choice website and activities. <clears throat> Excuse me. Remember, the more you engage, the more you earn. This panel counts as an activity towards career choice gear, as do the other panels. The scavenger hunt and survey will be coming Thursday. Thank you to our moderator, panelists, teachers, and sponsors who made today's discussion possible. We couldn't bring career choice to our regional students without you. Here's hoping that we get to see you all, business students and teachers, back in person next school year. Thank you.